Hello, this is Bill Morgan, president of Parker University, and I'm here with Dr. Stu McGill, the world-renowned scientist and comedian up in his home in Canada. Well, thanks for having us, Stu. Well, it's, it's my pleasure, Bill. <laughs> Welcome to uh, Gravenhurst here. I wish we had uh, a little bit better weather for you. Last week it was minus 23, and uh, I was hoping for that, but I think we're just a, a degree or two below freezing. But uh, welcome once again. Fabulous yeah. to have you here. Well, thank you. We're a little heartbroken that it's not below <laughs> <laughs> freezing, 22 below. Uh, but yes, there's plenty of snow out there for us. Um, it's glad, glad, glad to be here. We'd like to talk about uh, some, our favorite su subject, which is the spine, lumbar spine. And uh, we've talked a little bit about nonspecific low back pain and how that's affected the world and how we put so much research into non-specific back pain. What's your opinion on that? Well, uh, th this could be an hour uh, discussion, but basically, to me, there's no such thing as non-specific back pain. Have you ever heard of non-specific leg pain? Could you imagine uh, someone coming to a clinic and saying, I've got non-specific leg pain, the clinician fails to assess it further, and they haven't a clue whether it's a fracture, or an infection, uh, a hangnail, uh, a skin disease, or, or what? And, and exactly the same situation uh, covers back pain. Back pain is highly specific. Uh, it's a very non-homogeneous uh, condition. Uh, so it demands that it be assessed to figure out what the very precise cause of that back pain is. And once that is understood, you now have a roadmap to direct what does that person need to do to eliminate the cause, and then what do they need to do to build the foundation in this linkage to be able to uh, perform the activities pain-free. So that's, that's my, my thought on it. All these randomized controlled trials on nonspecific back pain that compare exercise to chiropractic to physical therapy. And then uh, at the end they conclude, well, either nothing works or everything works. It's a waste of effort. If they can subcategorize the uh, back pain uh, mechanism, now they're able to match specific therapeutic approaches with specific mechanisms of pain. Now the efficacy goes way up and the, uh, I, could, I would even take that a step further. You then combine that with clinical mastery. So uh, these days to get a therapeutic test or assessment published in one of the uh, therapy or medical journals, the journal will demand, show us the reliability of the test. Uh, I was asked to write an editorial for Archives of Physical Medicine a few years ago for my opinions on, I don't think it's that important for me to use tests that are proven reliability. Uh, do I want to have a master clinician obtain the same information as a junior first year clinical student? No that clinical mastery will pull out so much more information. Uh, we'll see this as we work through this morning, to play with nuances of effort and different stiffnesses, different joint positions. We're going to migrate stress from one tissue to another and really get a, a good understanding of the precision of why that person is in pain and why they've failed to uh, get better in the past. So you have pretty high confidence you can isolate the non-specific back pain down to the specific pain generator and then address that? In most patients, absolutely yes. Not in all, but uh, in most. And it's a combination of listening to their story. We're doing p pattern recognition. If a person can't tell the difference, if that leg pain patient comes in between the story the patient tells if they have a torn ACL or uh, a vascular claudication in their leg, if the clinician can't just listen to the story and recognize the pattern, they must stop and go get another job. They're not competent. So in back pain, I listen to the story to recognize the patterns, and then I go and test it by using combinations of different motions, postures, and loads, which migrates, migrates the stress from different load-bearing tissues. We stress different nerve roots, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and keep honing it down. And then at the very end of all of this, 
We have our hypothesis of what the pain is. We've eliminated the suspect alternatives so we know what the pain isn't. That's all part of it. And then we can predict what is going to be seen as a feature on a medical image. So now we have context for interpreting what we see on the image. And when you put all of this together, uh, a master will come up with uh, understanding and proving uh, the full pathway of pain mechanism. I just can okay, help work on the largest chiropractic low back study ever done, ever done for randomized control at, with the Department of Defense. And we pulled everything into one, one big category of the discs, the facets, the spondies, everybody but were in the same category. When we do studies like that, it's, I, I just wonder, like you said, the, the leg, I, I think of like gut pain. If they, if they treated gut pain like we treat back pain in research, somebody with diverticulitis or an ulcer, an appendicitis, kidney disease, all these other mechanisms, they do a treatment and the, the, the treatment would be effective 15% of the time, so that doesn't work for, for gut pain. But we do the same thing for back pain. We put it all into one big category. I, I'm, I'm almost in tears with the patients every week as they come and I listen to their story. I don't see the average back pain patient. I only see the patient who's failed. They've already been to 12 different clinicians. I'll say, what did they, what, what, how did they find out what the cause was? And the patient will say, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, tell me about the assessments that they did to find out what the cause of your pain is. And I hear time after time again, oh, uh, well, they really didn't do an assessment or one person said they couldn't find my pain and then they started to, 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 to tell me the pain is really in my head and another guy wanted to amputate my foot because I have terrible foot pain. Turned out he had a lumbar trap and it's a referred pain. Or you really want to be a, a woman rather than a man and this is the emotional cause of your back pain. And none of these people were that mysterious or difficult to figure out once the thorough assessment had been uh, performed. Now, there's no question that the emotional and the social side of people's lives modulate their pain, but it doesn't cause the initiation of the pain in the first place. It's usually actual stress or outright damage to a person's spine, whether it's been acute or cumulative. And when you figure out that pathway, you can then see, yes, they have a pressure. They have to provide for their kids. They have to go back to work, but they don't, they, they know that they can't go back and work a jackhammer and nor could I. But that was definitely an impediment. Or the, the, the woman might say to you, uh, I'm a stay at home mom. And I say, good, I really need you to build frontal plane stiffness and control. We just proved here in the clinic that that took your pain away. I need you to walk three times a day after dinner, I want you to go for a walk. And she'll say, well, I can't do that if I, I'm, I'm afraid to walk out of my neighborhood at night when it's dark. If I can't deal with that impediment, I will fail too. So these are all forces and influences on success. And uh, the detailed assessment will reveal them. And as I said, it's then the clinical mastery component that takes us into a suitable uh, program that really addresses their cause and builds their foundation to move. And those limitations in chiropractic, we call that limitations of matter. There's only, there, you can take it so far. Sometimes you just, you, you just can't get to that level of, of being fixed. Now, what would you say to someone who said, well, yeah, the patients come see Dr. McGill. They have a high expectancy to get better because he's the world renowned Dr. McGill. Is there a psychosocial component to, to the healing? Yes and no. Uh, I could play that both ways. Just thinking about different patients, I uh, will think of one. This was several years ago, and uh, he had really run the full gamut of uh, various clinical flavors of uh, practitioners. And then they sent him to a pain clinic, and the pain clinic loaded him up on Demerol, and we know where that's going. And then they told him, we cannot figure out a structural reason for your back pain. The pain is really in your head. And he said to me, uh, I cannot live with the fact that I'm crazy. If the pain is in my head, I'm going to end it next week. I'm committing suicide. I'm, I'm, I can't take this that I'm crazy. I'm giving you one week. Now I hear you're different. 
and I've flown in for this, but I, I'm giving you one week. And I said, uh, okay, would you show me what causes your pain? And he described the pain as someone taking glass and opening up his hamstrings as this shard of glass opened up his leg. And I said, well, oh, you look quite good now. And he says, I am quite good now, but uh, I, I want you to, uh, can you show me the, the, the mechanism of pain? You've been to 12 different clinicians. Has any of them ever asked you what causes your pain? And he said, uh, no, no one's ever asked me to show them. And I thought, what an indictment of clinical practice of what's going out there broadly in terms of how back pain is dealt with. So he did the most bizarre uh, movement, if I can. I'm just going to stand up. And he wound himself around in a circle like this. And as he came through the arc to Top Dead Center, ah, and he got this horrible trap down his back. Now, I had my instrumentation on at the same time. This was uh, back at the university. And his spine clunked as he came up through Top Dead Center. So on an MRI or any medical image, there was nothing there. It was a micro movement of the joint actually clunking. So as he was winding himself through the range of motion, he was using muscle and the muscle contributed stiffness and the stiffness was controlling his spine. But he had a little bit of disc damage. So if you can see in this model here, and I know you're very familiar with this, Bill, because we've talked about this many times over the years. This joint has normal stiffness. This joint has normal stiffness. But this has a little bit of damage to the end plate. And the turgor, the stiffness of the disc, has been lost. So if I twist, you see how the majority of the emotion is occurring at the joint of less stiffness. So as he wound himself up through top dead center, the micro movement, now that's occurring just at that joint, trapped that nerve root and it was right down his right hamstring. But there was no medical image. So then we have our brothers and sisters in the clinical world who will say, well, the image didn't correlate to the pain. If you don't understand the patient's pain mechanism through a very thorough assessment, you have no context to understand and interpret the image. And I, and I know you've, you've written the definitive work on this. So uh, the point was, I, I couldn't help this fella anymore that day. We tried to decompress his disc back, and I said, you come back in three days, but don't do anything stupid. I know exactly what's going on now. I've measured it. Come back in three days. He came back in three days, the nerve trap had settled down, and I said to him this time, push my fingers out. So I placed my fingers not into rectus, but lateral to the navel, so he had to push me out with his obliques. Now this was a little bit of an experiment to give controlling stiffness. I said, repeat the offending mechanism. He wound himself around, came up through top, ah, 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 ah. Ah, no pain. I said, do it again. And he did it again. Zero trap, because we then created a stiffening guy wire system to take out the micro movement that was allowing the, the uh, uh, trapped uh, sciatic root. So my, my, my point in all of that is a thorough assessment really reveals the mechanism. It may or may not have anything to do with the image because that particular image was a static one. But if we used a fluoroscopic measure, now we see the mechanism uh, perfectly because, as you know, it's a real-time moving x-ray. So I've, I've said quite a bit in, in that statement, but uh, there, there, there's, a, there, there's a... Well, right, that's, that says a lot right there. So, so I, if I right. just go back to your original question, do they have expectations of me? Yes, they do, but it goes two ways. My feet are really held to the fire as well, because in that case, I was the last line before he got lead poisoning. And uh, I did meet him a few years later. In fact, it was last summer because he brought his daughter here. She was a heavy field athlete, scholarship uh, athlete. And uh, he said, no, I never had another nerve trap again in my life. He engineered it out completely. And then over time, as we both know, gristling will take place and naturally control and return that stiffness back. So he didn't have degenerative disc disease he actually had a gristling process that eventually took him out of pain. And he's a heavy worker now, 
uh, just right as rain. But anyway, so that goes both ways. My my feet are really held to the fire sometimes. Well, and it goes in the, the same category. Right now, I know if, if you pay attention to what happens in the States, right now, everybody hates straws. It, it's all of a sudden, straws are the enemy. But also, lump x-rays, MRIs, it's, just, it's, 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 it's like they are, not only are they, they are not useful, you should avoid them at all costs. You shouldn't do advanced imagery, you shouldn't do x-rays, you shouldn't do um, any of these advanced um, diagnostic procedures, instead you should focus on cognitive reasoning. That's the, the big thrust, it seems, right now in, in, in healthcare for taking care of the back. Now, you and I have seen the trends over the years from the Williams flexion exercises to McKinsey's extension exercises to multifidus stiffening exercises to whatever the holy grail of, you know, we've, we've seen the shift time after time. And this is the, it, this is the cure for all back pain only to have it whittled away and proven up. That's, that's the cure for a type of back pain possibly, but it's not universal. Where do, where do, where do imageries fit in? Where does advanced um, diagnostics studies fit into the world of, of, of clinical practice? Well, I, I certainly am sympathetic to the position of the overuse of MRs and the inability, and this is a bit of an indictment once again, of many radiologists to see the mechanism of tissue damage. So when they use the word degenerative disc disease, I put that in the same category of nonspecific back pain. It's a garbage term. In every person who comes here with the diagnosis of degenerative disc disease, we can hone it down so much more. Is there history of end plate fracture, Smarls nodes, type 1 modic change, which is the inflammation of the uh, response, the body's response to nucleus that is breached through a small fracture into the vertebra. Um, th th this whole story is there for you to see if you can interpret it. However, over time that pain will burn out and we, we've seen this many times where the nasty looking uh, joint with bone spurs and you can tell that's not a new injury but that's not the pain source. It might be two layers above which is now taking the brunt of the motion responsibility and that might be where the pain is from and we measure that clinically in our clinical exam. But the image in my world of people who have failed uh, several layers of clinical approaches, the imaging is uh, quite often very important. We talked earlier about some of the interesting nerve traps and drags as we like to call them. So as people move, uh, the nerve roots floss back and forth. Uh, we might see a little Tarloff cyst on one nerve root or pick a sacral nerve. So when we pull on that nerve, they say, oh, you know, they're showing us exactly the pain pattern that we recognize <clears throat> is associated with that root. But we can't be any more precise until we look at the image. And then we see the erosive bone around the cyst. And we understand now for the first time why when they drive a car, they have that unrelenting pain. And uh, I do not have any clinical ability to deal with Tarloff cysts, but we both know of surgeons who are clinical masters at dealing with that cyst. There aren't very many of them. But the masters uh, do have a much better success. But we wouldn't have the ability to change that person's life until we had the image to confirm our understanding of a mechanism that we knew was there, but we hadn't defined it precise enough. At the other end of the spectrum are the clinicians who see fresh back pain patients, and I'll agree, the image is probably not necessary on the first visit. If they are clever, they will figure out the offending motions, postures, and loads, mitigate those coach movement patterns and strategies to avoid the stress that mm -hmm. is caused by those specific moves. And uh, you know, if, if, if people have trouble understanding this, go and uh, coach in the world of athletics. The hacks that every athlete uses to get around pain and enhance performance are the things, the only things that they have available to them, which are changing a motion, a posture, a load, stability, mobility, tuning their body, and uh, getting that pain-free performance. That's exactly what we do with the uh, 
very, very low functioning stay at home mom who simply wants to be able to pick her baby up out of the crib at two in the morning. It doesn't matter how she deadlifts. No. But it changes her world when she can feed her baby at night. Exactly right. And we talked about what going to going to what the patient needs, being patient centric in, instead of profession centric. Instead of you fitting into my world, what do you need from me? What is that thing that's going to give you your life back? And we talked about people losing their ability to live independently. And just if you, once you lose the ability to get out of a stool, you, you know, you've lost your independence. So by us training them to be able to rise from the sitting position or provide a care that will allow them to do that simple activity, you may give them 10 more years of independent living before they go to assisted living. But getting back to uh, imagery, it's, I think it's overused. I know weak clinicians use this as a screening. And having worked in hospitals, I've seen the, the, the gatekeepers in healthcare are the ones who know the least about musculoskeletal care. So you come to an internal medicine doc or family care doc, and they don't know what's going on. Let's go to an MRI. And they're used to reading, reading reports and they interact. Oh yes, you've got a disc bulge. So that's what the problem is there. And how many times have you had people come in I've got a disc bulge. It's going to be tough for you to treat, Dr. McGill, where you and I would look at that. Yeah, that's, that's the inappropriate use of that technology. But MRI and x-ray is very effective for certain things. Like looking at motor one change is highly predictive for low back pain. But also, motor changes progress to motor two, one progress to motor two changes where the pain is reduced. The, 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 pain, the inflammation burns itself out or if there's multifidus atrophy, it's predictive of dysfunction as well. So there's, there's a time and place, but I think using your master clinical skills and applying it to the advanced imagery is where the value is. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, Michael Shacklock, who uh, we uh, both know has a, a nice quote, and I won't get this exactly, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically uh, medical images are not the problem. It's how we explain the results to patients. That's the problem. Ooh, I, I think the, st the study needs to be done. That you know, you is if I, if somebody came to you and said, yeah, because I also don't want people to, you know, if I don't tell them what's on the MRI, and somebody else does, well, Morgan, he didn't know I had a Tarloff cyst, he didn't know I had motor one changes or spondylosis or this. But if they focus, they fixate on that, that's where you got to have problems. Where you can explain it to them, say you've got these things, but these are incidental findings or can be incidental findings. Yeah, you, you know, um, when I uh, started our, our clinical program at the university, I got to build that right from the ground up. And uh, our appointments with patients started out at two hours in length and people were saying, two hours long, or, or you know, <laughs> it, <laughs> this is very untraditional. Well, we soon moved it to three hours because we started with an extensive uh, interview and it was the pattern recognition that we were able to pick up in the interview that allowed us to get some ideas. And we would read the MR reports and uh, realize very quickly they're inappropriate. We need to see the image. You have to look at the and images. We had to look at the images. And we'd been the ones who had on cadaveric spines, we would call them the virgin uninjured spine, and then we would expose those spines to different loading regimens. We knew exactly what caused a disc bulge. We know exactly why that large framed person had a limacon shape to their disc and why they had a very focal disc bulge and why they responded to a McKenzie extension retreatment to resolve the bulge because an ovoid disc of a more slender person would not and it's all stress strain and and how the anatomy determines how that stress uh, uh, changes the the uh, disc bulge on whether it will shrink or grow and and uh, all of these sorts of things. Anyway, it's so much fun. Well, Dr. McGill, I think what it comes down to is seeking mastery. Throughout, as as is if if you're just being, um, you know, flipping about your care or, or perfunctory, you're gonna you know, you request unneeded images. You'll you'll try to have the patient fit into what you feel everybody should get for treatment plan. You give them a sheet of paper here, do these exercises. But with mastery, it's hard. It takes concentration. And I think one of the things that you bring to the world is the need to emphasize mastery. And thank you for taking this time to, to talk to us today. And, and we just look forward to talking to you more in the future. But again, thanks for well, this. Thanks so much. It's been a ball. Thanks.